Oh, let me, got it, you wait. Hold it, this meeting is being recorded, got it. Um, arrows, correct, or no? Down no, arrows. arrows, yep, got it. Forgot to ask about that. Uh, participant microphones will be muted at entry, and if you have any questions during the event, please use the chat box. And the session will be is being recorded and will be available <clears> by the next <throat> business day. If you have any questions after the session, please feel free to email newengland at mhttcnetwork.org. And the next slide, this slide provides an overview of our acknowledgement statement for the MHTTC. Next slide, please. The MHTTC network uses affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all activities. That language is strengths-based and hopeful, inclusive and accepting of our diverse cultures, genders, perspectives, and experiences, healing-centered and trauma-responsive, inviting to individuals participating in their own journeys, person-first and free of labels, non-judgmental and avoiding assumptions, respectful, clear, and understandable, <clears throat> consistent with our actions, policies, and products. With that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Dr. Machiri Keshavan for introductions. Thank you, Courtney, and good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. It's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Leitman, who is a friend and I have known him for many years. He's going to be addressing a very important topic in the area of treating people with serious mental illness, and that is an optimal treatment of um, psychotic disorders using clozapine. Let me say a little bit about Dr. Lightman. So he is an internist and a nephrologist. He is uh, the medical director of the Westchester um, uh, uh, Bronx Medical Group. And uh, he, for many years, has really made the management of severely ill individuals with psychosis with clozapine a, a form of art. And he brings passion to this in, uh, you know, through his team, Daniel. He has dedicated his service to his son who benefited from clozapine. And then we know that uh, you know, this is a treatment that uh, quite often is a miracle for, for our patients who are suffering from serious mental illness, but it's also a complex medicine with multiple side effects that have to be understood and monitored. Who better to teach that than someone who is at the front line taking care of these patients who brings enormous knowledge of medicine uh, you know, psychiatrists, we are trained in medicine, but we often forget medicine. We need an internist to teach us how to take care of our, of our most complex patients. So this is a unique opportunity for the field for someone like Dr. Leitman to tell us how to do this. So with that, I also want to um, point out that this is a um, uh, presentation that is co-sponsored both by the SAMHSA MHTTC, as Courtney said, but also by the Massachusetts Mental Health Center, uh, where I am sitting, a premier academic uh, clinical institution in the Boston area. Uh, thank you, and uh, Robert, please take it away. Thanks, Kesh. And I am really passionate about this. And yes, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my son. So 15 years ago, Daniel developed schizophrenia, and I really found that the treatments for him were wanting, the expectations were less, and I just didn't find that acceptable. And I actually went up to Harvard and Deborah Levy was instrumental in this. And she said, your, your son should be on clozapine. And this was several months into his illness. It took me a full year to finally convince another psychiatrist. And then essentially my wife and I also an internist, Dr. Ann Mandel, and I took over his regimen. And I'm happy to report that, you know, despite what we were told that his life was essentially over, it just wasn't true. My son, Daniel Leitman, you should look him up on YouTube, he's brilliant, um, is a stand-up comic in New York City and living a life, a full life. And this led us to say, maybe we're on to something. And so we then started to treat other people because other people heard about Daniel after we went to the NAMI uh, community. And... Uh, you know, what we were faced with was, and I wanted to define some terms. The first term I like to define is clozophobia, the irrational fear of clozapine. 
And it starts way back when. They never understood clozapine. It's been around for a very long time. It's the second antipsychotic, really, that was synthesized after Thorazine, 1958, second major one, that is. And it was widely used in Europe and started to be used in experimental nature in the United States. 1975, there was what we call the Finnish pandemic, where 16 elderly women in a small southern Finnish village developed something called agranulocytosis, and eight of those succumbed. There's never been anything like that that's happened since then, but at that time, clozapine came off the market only to be reintroduced for compassionate use. And then finally, in 1989, John Kane brought it back to the United States after it was shown to be uh, very useful with resistant schizophrenia, defined as failing two other antipsychotics, really held to a very high standard at that time. And it was bundled and it was expensive. And Sandoz really tried to make as much money as they could. They had their new drug indication. And the best it ever did in the United States was about a 10 to 12% market share. And it just, as soon as the uh, patent went, even after Herb Meltzer did the uh, intercept study showing that schizophrenia, uh, people with uh, schizophrenia and suicidality um, benefit from clozapine. Sandoz didn't get a new drug indication. And since then, its market has gone completely away almost in the United States. And this is what we were faced with, the irrational fear of clozapine. And this is what was presented to us. People told us that agranulocytosis, 3%, I was quoted, I remember this. And they said, they all die, just not the case. Seizures, intractable weight gain, sedation, drooling, intractable constipation. Why would you do this to your son? It's a last resort. And this is how it's presented. Not one psychiatrist, and we went to about a half dozen initially, said it's the most effective medicine in all settings, which it is. It has the FDA indication for treatment resistance, schizophrenia. It reduces suicide, it reduces violence. It reduces substance abuse. Yes. And you know what? When we went to Harvard, we did meet a gentleman by the name of uh, Michael Muffson. And he said to us, and it sticks with me to this day, the only kids I have on clozapine that go on to college and have a full life, or the only kids that I have with schizophrenia that go on and have a full life are all on clozapine. So it allows the most robust and full social and cognitive rehabilitation. And on top of that, they live longer. So I think we're missing an enormous opportunity with clozapine. It's marketed right now. And uh, I know Dr. Coates tomorrow is going to do a large uh, presentation where he says that only 20% of the population with schizophrenia is eligible for, college, uh, for clozapine. I, I don't think that's the case. The first year of psychosis where it's not used, the risk of death is anywhere from 24 to 89 times. 50% of people with psychotic illnesses will try to complete a suicide up to 10% in some studies, but more like five to 10% will succeed. 3% or so do this in the first year. Clozapine reduces the risk of suicide by 80 to 90% against all other antipsychotics, 34% uh, versus, or 38% versus uh, olanzapine. So if we were treating 10,000 individuals with clozapine, we would save 380 to 900 lives. The reason people use not to use it is because of the acran risk. That's the predominant reason. And what is that mortality? It actually is less than 0.3% in the more recent studies. And it's one in 10,000 individuals in some study groups. In other large cohorts, it's zero, depending on how you're monitoring them. So REMS has you monitoring every two weeks or every week for the first 26 weeks and so on. But the greatest risk is truly in the first 18 weeks. After six months, believe it or not, when you compare the risk of agranulocytosis to the other antipsychotics, it is the same as some. And when you get to a year, uh, some recent studies coming out of South Africa, the risk was greater with Respiradol after a year with clozapine. So the context is, Iceland no longer monitors at all. Denmark makes monitoring mon uh, optional at 18 uh, weeks. 
And a lot of the other European nations are starting to think about this approach. Psychosis really cuts your life short. So the earlier you get these people treated, the better they will do. And you also get the other benefit of cigarette and drug abuse being lowered. Here you are. This is the FIN20 study. Um, and this is 62,000 individuals. If you're not on the antipsychotic and you have schizophrenia, you have almost a 50% mortality at 20 years. With any other antipsychotic, it's a quarter of, or about half of that. So you're down still a huge amount of these people die because these are people that are getting sick in their 20s. With clozapine, that risk is reduced to 16%. Suicide, 63 out of 100,000 per year is the going rate. With olanzapine, you see that reduced to 39. With clozapine, you see the risk reduced to the general population average. I'd like to turn now to talk a little about psychosis spectrum disorders. And really, it's, these are heterogeneous disorders with complex polygenetics that are neurodevelopmental and if not appropriately treated, neurodegenerative. So on this slide, you could see this is a, um, a, you know, a, a slide that's demonstrating all of the, uh, the genetic risks. It's a Manhattan plot. And the largest skyscraper there is the gene for uh, overexpression of complement C4A. And this is felt to be responsible for up to a quarter of the risk in a lot of the in, in the development of psychosis. A, a few of the smaller buildings there are often having to do with synapse formation, specifically alpha-7 nicotinic receptor, NMA, NMDA receptors. What is unique is clozapine has distinct effects on all of these modalities, uh, theoretically, especially on excessive CNS pruning, since it does uh, have a dramatic effect on microglia to decrease pruning. This slide is clinical course of schizophrenia, but I'm showing you this slide because this is where a lot of people come to me telling me about their, their loved one saying, well, his diagnosis is ADHD, bipolar, schizoaffective schizophrenia. And I go, well, which one is it? Well, if you look at this slide, you look at the neurobiology, the risk factors and the symptom severity, you can see where the confusion lies. Again, it's a neurodevelopmental disorder. A lot of these kids before adolescence are starting to have negative symptoms, uh, cognitive symptoms, and attention deficit is a very common diagnosis. And it's true, they have an inability to gate, to focus, to get rid of extraneous information. They're being flooded with information. Unfortunately, as that flooding continues, they'll often seek comfort in substances, most often pot. At that point, that increases your risk of psychosis fivefold. They'll have their first episode of psychosis and the diagnosis will be psychosis induced from substance abuse. You'll treat that with your usual uh, or, um, second generation antipsychotic, not clozapine, and it works. All these things work to a sense. So the dopamine dysregulation goes down. You're having continuation of the negative symptoms but they have another spike in symptoms. Now you're calling it bipolar with psychosis. And you can see the continuum to schizoaffective and then to schizophrenia, as you see more and more of a thought disorder develop in a more of a chronic phase of disorganization and um, decline. And so the clinical features of psychosis, everyone always is talking about the delusions, the hallucinations, the disorganized speech, the catatonia. That is, quote unquote, the psychotic breaks, right? But what really determines how well these kids do in the long term are the negative symptoms. And a lot of these people start out with executive function and processing speed deficits, which leads to social withdrawal, which then leads to a, you know, a logia, an avolition. They're not talking to people. They lose their sense of joy. Their attention and memory goes. And with that, they start to develop a sense of depression and hopelessness. And ultimately that can lead to suicidality. Finally, comorbid substance abuse. I put this as part of this slide because it is so common, 70 to 80%. Again, what is psychosis? But detachment from reality, 
so that you have social occupational dysfunction, work, interpersonal relationships, self-care, and your suffering. And that's our group. We are taking care of this psychotic spectrum, the entire spectrum. So at this point, I'm talking about, and the slides will present with the data, a cohort that is over one year has been with us. And it's a clozapine-centered approach. We have 40 other patients presently between six months and a year, and over another 100, going on 150, that we have some involvement with, and unfortunately some that we've lost to follow up. When they come to us, a little over half come to start clozapine. Previous providers could not or would not prescribe, but a fair number are coming because they need their side effects managed or they're still suffering. A lot of people will mistakenly stop because they hit this threshold where they're afraid of seizures or they're, they hit the magic number of 400 nanograms per deciliter and they say, oh, that's enough. They're, and they're, they're, they're not well. These kids get better, but you have to do the medicine. So our demographics are actually predominantly uh, male and you would predict that we wouldn't do so well in this group because males tend to have worse psychotic illnesses. Um, and, our, and our average age is 34. So most of these kids come to us with about a 10 plus year burden of 10 years of burden of disease. Our oldest is 75. She's been on clozapine for quite some time. And our youngest is 17. And we see uh, this and the, the population uh, otherwise reflects the US in terms of white, black, Hispanic, and Asian. And again, we see clozapine work in all of these cohorts. Our demographics in terms of the designated uh, diagnosis, it's mostly uh, the schizophrenia, uh, about three quarters, about 20% bipolar, 8% with uh, other psychotic illnesses, be it uh, depression with psychosis, substance abuse, and even uh, borderline personality. What also would predict that we do poorly though is almost 60% of our patients came to us with poor insight. Again, it's really not poor insight, it's anosognosia. It's the unawareness of illness. And these are the kids that typically do the worst. Nine patients I have presently on AOT, which is not available in Massachusetts, but I'm hoping someday. There's presently three states that don't have it. And Pennsylvania is a four state where functionally they don't have it. Even though it's law, it's not been enacted in any county. And again, this is court mandated treatment. So not everything's wine and roses when they come to us. 18 did refuse treatment and we could not obtain an AOT. So they disappeared. 10 discontinued. Again, I work with other psychiatrists, nurse practitioners, anyone that will work with me, and they left. Um, I lost one, uh, came off because he had an adverse side effect. 72-year-old gentleman with a renal transplant developed a cardiomyopathy. I have had two deaths. One was a 93-year-old woman. That was my oldest ever. She had been on clozapine forever at that point, and she just died of old age. And uh, we did, unfortunately, have one suicide. Again, 20 other patients were lost to follow up and four, unfortunately, were dismissed from the practice. So how are we different? The first and foremost thing is we use clozapine first thing if given the opportunity. It is not as a last resort. We believe the patient has a right to be well, not to live unencumbered by the medical establishment on the street, living in squalor and filth. And we will use any modality we can to engage him and his family. We start with Javier Amador's approach, LEAP, listen, empathize, agree, and partner. But if need be, we will go to court. And I will really, as long as I can get the court involved and I can get them engaged, I will get them into treatment. The other thing is we don't tolerate side effects. We're aggressive at the very beginning at using adjunctive medicines. Also, we realize that clozapine is a lifelong medicine. So there's no rush. Ultra slow titrations minimize side effects. And on top of that, we treat the whole patient. We talk diet and exercise. And our goal is not just to keep them out of the hospital, keep them alive. 
We want meaningful recovery and we want to return these people to their pre-existing baseline. And on top of that, to really achieve that, what we found and that is totally critical to the success is SMI, serious mental illness is a team sport. We engage them as a community, we engage their families and we really combat learned helplessness and hopelessness and we restore a sense of optimism. That's how we're different. All right, why clozapine first? We think we can change the trajectory of the disease. As I mentioned before, it has unique properties where it mitigates the excessive CNS pruning. It has effects at the NMDA receptors and the alpha-7 nicotinic receptors in the prefrontal cortex. So theoretically, it's going to have dramatic effects on negative symptoms. It takes a long time, but it is something that we are seeing. Um, the early treatment leads to the best outcome, including survival. Anything you do to shorten the duration of untreated psychosis is going to give you a better outcome. This has been shown from the KD study to Yamahora looking at claws being used you know, in Japan. Every single study, the earlier you use, the better. Then clozapine also has the best compliance in, and has the most robust recovery. When they did a study in, again, the Scandinavian countries, looking at who they can keep with compliance, the injections, the, the uh, long-term uh, injections blew all the oral medicines out of the water with one exception, that being clozapine. Again, you have to keep them alive, decrease early suicide. Aggression, as you're seeing every single day in the paper, you know, when you combine substance abuse and serious mental illness, serious violence is not an unusual circumstance. Clozapine uniquely reduces that risk. You reduce drugs and substance abuse. And again, as I said, you can get them into meaningful recovery. Unfortunately, this is the par for the courses from Henry Nasrally. He sent me this slide. The gentleman who's had a series of relapses came to him after about 10 years, and you can just see the brain melting away. It's more difficult to restore these people the longer you wait. So how do we define meaningful recovery in our group? Um, we really emphasize function. Again, returning these kids to society, making them contributing members, um, people that have purpose and meaning. There's nothing like it. So they're either employed, they're in school, they're a homemaker, they're in a rehab program on the way into a workplace, or they're at least doing 20 hours of volunteer work. And this is our results. So the literature right now uh, runs from anywhere from nine to 14% uh, recovery after uh, a one year time frame. New Zealand, the best results we've seen is where they had a 33% clozapine use. Um, and there the, the recovery rate was defined as 37%. And that was based on a GAF score of approximately 60. Um, our group using our meaningful recovery, we have about three quarters into meaningful recovery. And it's across all the spectrums of the illness. We don't do quite as well at this part with our 60 or so people in the schizophrenia spectrum and that you would kind of would expect. Um, and you know, as you go up and you go down the, the spectrum of psychosis, we, we do progressively better. This is what is kind of remarkable. AOT saves lives. We have eight of nine of our kids who really I could not relate to, or I was called names that I cannot repeat here. And I was called that early on in the AOT course. Some of these kids are my best friends now, and they're 89%, eight of nine meaningful recovery. This, is, this speaks for itself. 92% of our kids coming into my practice had been in the hospital the preceding year. Since being in the practice, this is one year out to 15 years, but at least with one year follow-up, we've only had nine patients return to the hospital. So as opposed to 92% in, we've had 92 to 93% out of the hospital. We've had some adverse outcomes, pneumonia, seizures, but that is what it is. Weight gain, 
Again, everyone was told that weight gain was inevitable. It is not. So with the lanzapine and clozapine, and this just comes right off of the, um, uh, the, the, the stuff that comes with, with the medicine, um, whatever that's called, 46% um, historical data with the lanzapine, 35%, a gain of 7% body weight. With Team Daniel, 20% or so. And what's cool about that is a lot of our kids actually came to us quite over, underweight. And this is something I, I had to learn to do correctly. I really didn't try to mitigate the weight gain in those people. And with those people, we, we ended up gaining on average of 10 pounds. But my overweight patients, again, BMIs of greater than 28 and to 35, and then BMIs from 35 upwards, we saw weight losses of 13 to 34 pounds so far. Substance abuse. 50% of our kids were either smoking pot primarily, but also some of them were using heroin and, and speed, mushroom, LSD, et cetera. Um, right now we're at 82% recovery. Only 9% of the team Daniel population is using illicit substances and pot. Cigarette cessation. Again, in the Eagle report, 15% were able to quit. Serious mental illness, people with serious mental illness smoke 50% of all the cigarettes consumed in the United States, even though it only represents up to 3% of the population. Even in healthy people, the success rate was only 38%. We've gotten 31 out of our 46 smokers to abstain from cigarettes. We use Chantix, nicotine replacement therapy, and a lot of bupropion. Again, not all wine and roses, as I said. We've had a lot of pneumonia, especially in the age of COVID. Uh, we've had two hospitalizations, but we've had no significant morbidity and no mortality. I've had no one in the intensive care unit. Um, I've had seizures. Again, we tend to push higher levels. Uh, we've had a cardiomyopathy and we've had one suicide. What we have not had is a granulocytosis, any VTE or myocarditis. We've had some neutropenia, but we've intervened when we've had to. I've used lithium, which is granulocyte stimulating factor. Um, and in the kids with substantial weight gain, we went back and looked more closely at their charts and seven of those really just would never take the medicines that were adjunctive and three are new to the weight uh, loss regimen because they finally agreed to do it. Um, secondary orthostasis help is an issue. Urinary difficulties. Again, these kids are embarrassed. You have to ask about it. But uh, enuresis, uh, nocturnal enuresis is a problem in these kids. And it gets better with behavioral modification and giving them DDAVP, antidiuretic hormone at bed, short acting. I've had no issues with hyponatremia. They've done well. And it, it's, it's a real dramatic release, not only the to the kid, but to the parents and everyone else. The other thing that they don't have, which you get with everything else, is movement disorders. And I can't emphasize that enough. Several of these kids came to me because they had tar dive. And I put them on the clozapine, and the tar dive has gotten dramatically better. So this is a slide that I just want to dwell on. Our patients, again, this is the goal. This is preliminary data. This is only 14 patients. We're still collecting our data for this. Um, but so far, uh, this is done by the patient and the family. So this is self-reported data. When they were pre-morbid, they had pretty good function. They had GAF scores of 80. So they had meaningful relationships. They were usually in school or they were working and they really didn't have pervasive symptoms. At their worst, these kids were fairly universally in the hospital. Many of them were actively suicidal. The next step was to get them on another antipsychotic. And indeed, there was treatment success, what we would call success. Their GAF score went from 19 to 38. But is 38 enough? 38, they're still severely handicapped. And they're out of the hospital, most of these kids. But they do not have a life. They're living in someone's basement. 
when they've come to us on previous clozapine regimens, they're into or the start of meaningful recovery, but they're still very symptomatic. They have few relationships. Our patients, at least this subcohort, cohort, returns to their baseline function. We're going to take a brief interlude as I need to go to the new slides. So I'm gonna pause the share. Let me see if I, or I can do a new share. Let me see if I do this right. Yes. And I believe share. Okay. So how do we do this? How do we achieve our goals? So the first and critical step is getting to know the patient and engaging not only the patient, but the family. I'm a big hugger. Matt Cash knows that. It can be a little embarrassing and not everyone's big with hugs. And so you have to be a little careful when you're approaching them. But I really let my guard down. And I'm an active cheerleader. And I believe in befriending these kids. There's these artificial barriers. These kids and their family are so in need of an embrace, a warm embrace. I listen reflectively. I try to empathize. I find something to agree on and I partner. I use Javier Amador's approach and I'll use anything to engage them because again, they have the right to be well. So I will turn to AOT. But what I always do is I try to make sure that they feel safe and accepted and again, Javier Amador, who's all about relationships, was a little critical of me. He says, Rob, do you have any boundaries? I have boundaries. I try to be somewhat professional, but sometimes we can get lost in the profession. These kids have been so lost for so long and so have their families. They just need a friend and they need to know that if they screw up, you're not going to abandon them. And hopefully they won't abandon me when I screw up because you know what? This is not perfect science. Everyone is different. There's a lot of heterogeneity and you've got to do the medicine. You've got to also always be available. Everyone has my cell phone number. I unfortunately just had to turn over my phone there because someone was trying to call me and I will call them back. Everyone has my email address. You've got to be available. And everyone leaves my office with a note detailing what I want them to do. And I share that with the family. Optimism is essential. It's your belief, believe it or not, your own belief that is so important in combating learned hopelessness. So the nuts and bolts of all this is you just have to do a, a real physical exam. You need to get a baseline on these people. The, um, as I said, I've had essentially no cardiac issues, except for that one elderly patient. But it's nice if you can get an echo, you should get it. Get your cardiogram. Uh, do your baseline, see if they're inflamed. That's the HSCRP. Get a troponin if their heart rate is elevated and follow it. Uh, make sure that they have lipids done, a chem panel. You obviously have to get your neutrophil count. Get your baseline glycohemoglobin and do your urine toxicology. And I do this every time. Ronald Reagan, I'm not a big fan, but he said something. Trust, but verify. I do it every time. But the one thing you have to do is therapeutic drug monitoring. You got to know, one, if they're taking it, and two, it gives you a guide in your treatment plan. The other thing we do, which is very different, is we're so aggressive about getting after the predictable side effects because they are predictable. Weight gain, triglycerides, and metabolic syndrome. I was so amused when I was reading the articles where they say high triglycerides predict success of treatment. No, that's not a correct approach. That just means you're getting good clozapine levels. Clozapine interferes with glucose homeostasis. It makes you glucose intolerant. These kids need to be on metformin, if that's not good enough at high doses, sodium glucose transport inhibitors, and where we found great success is with incretin mimetics, especially the glucagon-like one peptide uh, receptor agonist given weekly as injections. Tremendous success, and we're getting better and better at it. Again, as, the, the, as you go up on the levels, a resting tachycardia predicts that the levels are going up but you shouldn't put up with it. 
resting tachycardia, if it's high enough, can actually lead to a cardiomyopathy. In addition, having a fast heart rate often will stress the patient, causing more dopaminergic dysregulation. We like beta blockers that go across the blood-brain barrier for that reason. So we start with propranolol or metoprolol. Now, if there's no anxiety at all, and you just want heart rate control, the tenolol is fine. We use higher levels of our clozapine, and we're not afraid to do that. Having said that, I'm very generous with my use of lamotrigine, gabapentin, topiramate, and if violent, Depakote. Drooling, my son developed a six centimeter abscess early in his treatment. We fortunately were able to treat it at home. Most people can't do that. Not a lot of availability of people that are gonna put an IV in your kid's arm for every day for 28 days. So it's better to avoid it. Drooling is inevitable. It's not the clozapine, it's the norclozapine. And you can use topical agents, ipitropian nasal spray under the tongue, atropine eye drops work just fine. If they have no constipation, glycoperolate is very effective. It is an anticholinergic, does not cross the blood brain barrier. Botox, if you have the availability to do injections, can actually decrease the salivation dramatically for several months. And don't forget, elevate the head of the bed. Constipation, again, is one of those universal problems. Clozapine increases, well, actually it slows the transit time so that uh, often stool frequency will be reduced to daily to two to three days. And the one thing you cannot do, and I just, I don't have this on this slide, you do not give under any circumstance it fiber supplements because even though everyone's always saying, you know, do the uh, Metamucil challenge, fiber in itself slows the gut further. And what will often happen is you'll form a concretion, a, a bezoar, and you'll get obstruction. What you want to do is hydrate, make sure they have their coffee, but you're going to use stool softeners and you're going to use laxatives. And if that doesn't work, the more expensive items like the Secretogs are universally, you know, at least in our hands, been successful. We've been able to manage everyone's constipation. Neutropenia, again, I have never interrupted care, not once. And we're going up to, towards 300 individuals that we've treated at one time or another in the practice, secondary to neutropenia. One of the tricks is if it's low in the morning, use a circadian rhythm, repeat it in the afternoon. Also, neutrophils live on the margin of red blood cells. And just by exercising them, I'll have them run up and down the stairs um, for five minutes, demarginates the white cells and you'll get a 50% increase. So I've had kids that have come in with white counts of 0 0.7. I've had them do it's 1.1, we continue our merry way. And of course, you have to recognize benign ethnic neutropenia. And that's just a simple uh, test that's available at every blood bank in the area. Again, nighttime urination, DDAVP, as I already mentioned, mirbatrique relaxes bladder tone, but you have to be careful because it can cause constipation. Hypotension, especially early on in the treatment, be aware when you're doing your vital signs, you should be measuring it, not only sitting, but standing blood pressures. If they're dizzy, don't be afraid to use flood recortisone. Leads to sodium potassium retention or sodium retention and water retention. Emphasize a high salt diet. Nausea and vomiting with all these things that we do, also very common, especially because the entire GI tract is slowed down. We use a lot of ondansetron with great success. Goes right to the chemo trigger receptor zone, extremely well tolerated. Now, this is an important slide, but I wanna stop for a second and say, we don't even try to enhance clozapine's action until we have the positive symptoms under reasonable control. We have to quiet the mind first. With the exceptions of doing the uh, support modalities. So we start right away with socialization skills, education, vocation, cognitive behavioral therapy, family therapy, so important. Just decreasing the emotional temperature at home, learning, teaching people not to walk on eggshells, teaching them a reflective listening really helps with the kid's cognition because they can slow down, they can be heard at the table. But when you're talking about using pharmacologic approaches, you need to wait 
until they're meaningfully better. If you use it too early, you can actually worsen the psychosis. So the first things I've been turning to usually is because clozapine primarily sedates from antihistaminergic and anticholinergic properties. So usually the first drugs I've done off the bat and the ones that are the best tolerated <clears throat> are famotidine, which is an H2 blocker, but at very high doses, it increases histamine intracerebrally. And that helps with focus and decreases appetite. Pytalizant, which is being used and marketed for narcolepsy, also works and for that. But what I found out is in our clozapine group, you need to use much lower doses than is traditional. So we, we don't, we're very early into this data. We have only about 30 patients on it, but we're getting away with only using the beginning dose, which is uh, 4.45 and maybe 8.9 milligrams, not the traditional doses that are used with narcolepsy. And then we go after anticholinergic properties and we use acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and denepazole I'm so familiar with. And we've been, you know, and I must admit, I started, when I started Daniel on it, he had been an avid reader before he was sick, became an avid reader afterwards. And I've seen this effect. It's not everyone, but if the alpha-7 nicotinic receptor is really important for this kid, I've seen kids just pick up cognitively. As a sideline, it's really good because it also decreases your appetite, helps with the constipation, and slows down your heart. Bupropion, also very useful if they're cigarette smokers and good for attention deficit. And then, uh, and also bupropion, you have to be a little bit careful with because it does have some effects on clozapine metabolism and will gently increase it, not a lot, but enough. So that might be part of its effect with improving things as well. And then we use the traditional um, modophenol, armodophenol, and amantine, the dopaminergic indirect stimulators. Finally, we do consider fluvoxamine. I'll talk about that more later. And always we treat co-occurring conditions. Again, this is not easy. And this is our average number of prescriptions. And you know, if I showed you that early, I think you would have already turned off this talk. But if you set people up with a pillbox, they do it. We know this because we've been doing this for the last 15 years and they can take these medicines and they, there's no reason to suffer the side effects. And uh, you just, but you really have to do the medicine. This slide is more about the medicines that we don't use. We don't use the concert of the Ritalins. We do not use the typical stimulants. I mentioned Depakote earlier. I try to avoid it uh, just because it tends to make the cognition a little bit worse in terms of sedation. And it also is you know, tough with, with the weight gain. And on top of that, increases the risk for a granulocytosis. Cogentin is a drug I just don't use at all, essentially, with clozapine. We have seen um, some you know, um, movement disorders with very high doses. And I've had to use cogentin or Benadryl acutely with one kid who had a, a minor oculogyric uh, episode. But outside of that, hardly at all. And what we really don't use is multiple antipsychotics, except for when we're cross tapering one and starting another. Finally, benzodiazepines. Early on, I'm not a purist anymore. I still use it. It has a place, and especially if there's catatonia, you still need, you need it. The one magic bullet that we have and that we emphasize is exercise. So before the days of COVID, I used to have families come to my house every Saturday and the kids, and they would come to my pool, swim, come running with me. There was something magic about that form of engagement, just taking it out of the medical out of the medical environment. It was, you know, it just took the therapeutic relationship to another, that, uh, another level. Normalization and socialization. Since COVID, we've unfortunately had to transform our practice a little bit to Zoom. So every Saturday morning from 11 to two, I have families that Zoom with me and we do a lot of psychoeducation and we just go through where they are 
and what they need and you know how we can help them. And then Daniel, my son, from two to four, often going to five, another two to three hours, has the kids and he takes it through befriending and just developing relationships. And these kids have developed relationships with each other. And a group actually came down to Disney again um, with us, oh, 20 or so kids, and you know, send them to the parks. And a lot of these kids haven't had friends in years. And it's just, it, it's incredibly heartwarming. COVID's going away, we hope, we pray. B2 is on the horizon, so we don't know, but we are gonna be starting back at the house. Again, exercise the magic bullet. Everything gets better. And everything's possible with exercise. This is my little team. Off to my left is uh, Michael Orth, who's the head, the commissioner of mental health for Westchester and a, a decent marathon runner. And here's my two stars that have been running with me the longest. Uh, Jasper and Malachi, both on clozapine, both doing under 340 in a marathon. Anything is possible with clozapine. And these kids are doing great. We also talk about diet. If you run enough, it doesn't make much of a difference. But the bottom line is don't drink your calories and eat a complex diet full of fruits and vegetables. All right. How do we initiate it? As I said before, how are we different? We go very slowly. We, we approach therapeutic levels. I try to see the patient every week, mostly to get a relationship. And as the positive symptoms get better, I'll shift to bedtime. A lot of these kids are really suffering a lot of positive symptoms during the day. I believe in split dose regimens in the beginning. The next slide I have there because I want you to have it. I know it's impossible to look at it and it's incredibly busy, but this is something we've come out with that we've been distributing just to help you with the initiation of clozapine. It shows you how we titrate up, how we start to come off of other antipsychotics, how we add PRNs, how we add uh, medicines for the bowels and the weight and the anti-seizure uh, medicines and how we approach substance abuse. What are the benefits of ultra -slow, low titration? We get and we use the lowest doses that we need to use. And indeed, the doses can be quite low, even with people with schizophrenia spectrum disorders, 25 to 200 milligrams, and they're doing great. Bipolar, 12 and a half to 62.5. I wouldn't have believed it myself. And certainly that's not what was in the literature. And that's our bottom quarter. Um, and again, when you go slowly, you minimize side effects. It gives you an opportunity to treat the predictable side effects. And therefore, that leads to better acceptance. The other thing, and Jose de Leon just wrote a lovely paper about this, actually in 2021, going slowly re reduces the risk of myocarditis. Australia, where the use of clozapine is very good, they go up very quickly. But the, if you know, their myocarditis risk is much higher. Again, if you go slow, you minimize side effects, they take the medicine. It's a lifelong medicine. Take your time. And this is our typical titration schedule. In the PDR, 150 to 200, way too fast, even in the studies that I've seen mostly in the literature that are more reasonable, too fast. I go up usually 12 and a half milligrams every three days or so. Some kids even slower every week. And again, there's no standard dose. 300 milligrams for people on uh, clozapine. And a lot of this is because we use a lot of fluvoxamine. As I said, we're gonna use that over, about two thirds of our kids are on fluvoxamine and that essentially triples your clozapine level. So this 300 is a little deceptive as is the 100 with the bipolar illness. And as you can see, our levels are also all over the map, but they're high. Our medium level with people with schizophrenia is 727. And I have maintained a number of kids above 1000 because that's what they needed to have an optimal outcome. So you need to talk about how metabolism, how clozapine is metabolized. And it's primarily through the C1, uh, CYP, you know, cytochrome P450 system, 1A2, up over 70%. And with initiation, even more than that, goes through that pathway. There are other pathways, you know, you have 2D6, 
2C9, 3A4, 2C19, but there are small contributors. Um, cigarettes, it's not the nicotine that influences what goes on with clasping levels, the coal tar and the hydrocarbons. And what I've seen, we had one seizure, one, one kid got introduced back to the hospital and he was still smoking at the time, two packs a day, they stopped it. Well, his level doubled and he had a seizure. That was one of our seizures. Um, you have to be careful. You have to be aware of these things. Typically in the literature, it's 30 to 50%, but I said it can be dramatically more. Caffeine also increases clasping levels. It's great for your bowels and it's good for attention, but depending on how much you drink, it can influence clasping levels. I've seen 30, 40, 50% increases. Some kids were drinking too much coffee. I really like people to stick at around two cups a day, maybe four. That's about what I drink. Now, some people say I drink six, but you know, not that much. And you have to be aware of other drugs. For instance, someone has urinary infection, you give them Cipro, that will triple their level. Finally, when someone is ill, especially these days in COVID, if they have fever and they have a lower respiratory infection or any serious illness leading to fever, you need to be proactive. The inflammatory exudate shuts down the cytochrome P450 system. And you can see up to a tripling of the level of, of clozapine. So even though we say reduce it 50%, a colleague, uh, Sisking, just came out and updated that. And I, I tend to agree with them. I would reduce, depending on how sick they were, and especially if they're more lethargic than normal, I would reduce it to a third. Now, staying with the four, P450 system, clozapine primarily metabolized to norclozapine. The only active antipsychotic with clozapine is clozapine, not norclozapine and not the other metabolites. Norclozapine, however, also contributes to side effects. So especially in some of these kids who, one, I couldn't get levels because they were cigarette smokers, you have to block the metabolic pathway, but you have to do it exceedingly carefully. So at 12 hours, which is when you should be doing your, your monitoring, the ratio of clozapine and norclozapine is about 1.3, and that's exactly what we got. After we added fluvoxamine on average, we doubled that ratio to 2.6. And what that does is it allows us to use more clozapine and minimize side effects. So the most dramatic improvement in side effect is the silurea, the excess salivation, because that's primarily norclozapine related. But I've seen improvements, sedation, sleep time, weight, positive and negative symptoms. The big risk is we're going up to higher levels altogether and clozapine lowers uh, the, the, the uh, seizure threshold. So you really have to prophylax for seizure. This is nothing you do lightly. You have to monitor at every step. The other thing that also gets worse is often the constipation because norclozapine is cholinergic. So you've got to be careful. We start with, believe it or not, 6.25 milligrams of fluvoxamine and you check levels every single time. I've seen clozapine levels go up 20, 30% with that and then you'll go up to 12.5 typically, and then to 25. And I check therapeutic drug monitoring every step of the way. Very important, you don't do this lightly. So if I had everything that I wanted, I would have a psychiatrist. Fortunately, we are actually having my wife and I, two psychiatrists join us in practice. I'm not paying for them, I'm done with the finances, all this, but I've been training them, they've been at uh, Four Winds, which is a local hospital, and they're going to be starting into private practice as well. An internist, a neurologist, anyone adept at clozapine. Again, you have to do the medicine to do this right. We have two social workers already and a third joining us in practice, all engaged in psychosis of form CBT. And they're also helping with case management. And unfortunately, we've had some legal interface. They've been useful there. One of my psychiatric social workers has been on clozapine for about 31 years. She graduated at Columbia with a 4.0 and has run an ACT team and is also my peer counselor and a social worker. We befriend, we create community. This is something that's ongoing. I don't expect you all to invite your 
uh, your patients to your house, but there is something that you can do. You can set up these community centers so that these kids are normalized. Taking them out of the office changes this. Exercise and nutrition is important and they respond. They're well enough to participate in their own care. Again, family support, lowering the emotional temperature, using the LEAP method. Substance abuse, dogs matter. My dog, Minnie, instrumental in the care of these kids. Uh, it's a full file. Dr. Lightman, you have about three minutes. Yep, that's where we're at. We're almost there. So the last thing is people always say, how about the blood draw? Well, that's changed. We now have a point of care device. It's called the Clis it's called the Atlas device, and it does finger sticks at home. It's changed the paradigm. It's made it easier for everyone. It goes directly into the REM system. What do people say about our attempt at doing this? Clozapine quieted my mind instead of deadening it. Kids on clozapine look normal. <clears throat> they are normal. They turn their lights on. It's the restoration of lost souls. This is from Stephen Stahl. We were told to grieve. They were wrong. This is our Zoom community. We're not alone these days. Uh, Silver Hill in Connecticut, Rocky Murata really is following most of our approaches as his viewpoint, which is a dual diagnosis clinic in Arizona. Uh, Dr. Gopal at University of Maryland, and there's more. It was approached by uh, first episode psychosis up in Albany, and I'm hoping to work with them as well. But what are the harsh realities? How are we doing in the United States? This is the disease we're trying to combat. It's a huge cost. Three million people are suffering. It's lifelong. And the best treatment is clearly clozapine. How do we do that? How do we prescribe in the US? We're dismal. We're the worst in the world. 4% of all prescriptions, and that means less than 2% because only 50% get any treatment at all. So we have a lot of work to do. And this is what we need to do. We need to improve AOT and HIPAA laws because if you can't engage, you can't get support, you can't communicate, you can't even get psycho, you can't even get started with treatment. You need to minimize the duration of untreated psychosis. REMS needs to change. I don't object to the first 18 weeks. Again, 90 to 95% of the risk is there. But after 18 weeks, it makes absolutely near zero sense. And we need to be able to use this medicine. And I want to cut all barriers to its use. So using Atlas is very important. And then it's a tremendous amount of work. The reimbursements are horrible. I was a physician for single payer. I am no longer that. Now that I've transferred my practice basically only to taking care of people with psychosis, you can't make a living. I am out of all insurance because they just didn't pay enough. That said, if you are if you got someone with resistant schizophrenia and you're treating them with multiple antipsychotics, you need to be punished for that. I'm sorry if you're not willing to do a trial of clozapine. That's unacceptable and reimbursement should be cut. Finally, we need a long-acting injectable. The best way of delivering is a long-acting injectable and clozapine is available as injectable in Europe, in Denmark, in England, and um, it's in Holland, it's synthesized there. But what you always have to remember after all is said and done, be kind, but you have to be competent. So there's my books. And here is my, if you wanna connect, and I really would like to connect. I'm going to be up in Boston uh, in a month. I'm running the marathon. If people are interested in, especially in Boston, I run with uh, Bill Rogers the day before the race. So just for that reason alone, if you're any of you guys are runners, um, get my contact information and call me. I'm staying at the, the Envoy, I believe, hotel up there. Um, and I am looking for a partner because I'm a clinician. And I really believe our data is remarkable. And I think it belongs in the medical literature. So if anyone wants to talk to me, please contact me. This is why I went to Matt to Kesh originally. I want a partner because again, I'm a clinician. That's what I love. That's what I'm good at. This is a naturalistic study, but there's tremendous information and I want this in 
the medical literature. So thank you, any questions? I'd be glad to take, let me see chat. There, done. Thank you very much, uh, Robert, for a really inf inspirational and uh, informative talk. I guess uh, there might be time for one question, but those who haven't been able to um, ask questions, as uh, uh, Rob said, you can connect uh, through email or send an email to me and I'll forward to Dr. Light. Yeah, also, I'm going to stay on for if you don't, okay. if you'll have so, me, other people. I know so, I have to sign off, but uh, uh, Rob, I'll connect with you later. Thank you. All right, Cash. Thanks so much. So, anyone, I will be glad to answer any questions. Can we unmute people if they're still here? Uh, yes. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box and we can read them aloud or you should be able to unmute yourself. All right, Beth. Yep. Can you unmute? That would be the easiest way. Here, can I get rid of the slides? Or here, wait, let me get rid of that so you guys can get my, my cell phone and all the rest. Oh, and, um, and I want to say, um, unfortunately, we have a waiting list of 25 people and you know, which I'm hopefully gonna to give to the two new people starting. My wife and I um, are a bit overwhelmed. I have 127 uh, people on REMS alone and about 160 active clozapine patients. But outside of that, I want other people to do that. That's my goal, my goal and I'll help. So where's uh, chat, chat, oh, chat. someone had a question. And- Hi, Hi this is Bess, I'm able to unmute now. Oh, good. Um, so thank you so, firstly, thank you so much for this. It's so important and wonderful um, and definitely information that needs to be spread more widely. Um, my question is in regards to speaking with clients and their families when they come into our first episode psychosis clinic, we have a CSC program here in New Mexico. And when we have young people come in and our doctors start talking to them about medication options, um, I'm not sure our psychiatrists necessarily bring up clozapine right away as an option. Um, usually they will save that for after three trials of our antipsychotic medications. And so I guess I'm wondering if you have suggestions how to enjoy this conversation. Uh, right uh, absolutely. Um, so McCutcheon and Howe um, wrote a real